Good morning to everyone. It is now about six minutes, maybe seven minutes before 930. And as we normally do, we come on just a little bit early just to give us all a chance to greet one another, just to put in a couple of encouraging messages and to give any announcements and to get prepared for the Sunday school lesson on this morning. It also helps me if I have to make some technical adjustments. So to everyone who's logging on with us, those that may not know me or be familiar with our church, uh, my name is Rodney Smith Sr. and I pastor New Hebrew Missionary Baptist Church where God has blessed me to be for over 13 years now. And I cannot tell you that we are uh, praising God, learning with uh, each other, learning God's word, and God could not have put me with a better group of people. Uh, Sometimes they call me and tease me. Sometimes they call me and check on me. I have a good time talking with the members and the staff, the deacons and things of that nature. And it's just a beautiful fellowship that God has created with us. Uh, we are not a perfect church, as I've always said. And if you find a perfect church, don't join it because it will not be perfect anymore. There's no such thing as a perfect church. And so I want you to get ready this morning. This morning's lesson from John chapter 11 is a very good lesson. We've gone over it. Many of us who are familiar with scripture, we've gone over it before in times past, but there's something about God's word. His word is inexhaustible. You can go over it now, you can go over it later, and you always come back and learn something, it seems, each time you go over it. So please be careful not to gloss over John 11 especially when we get to the verse that many of us would say as children when it was our time to say grace. Jesus wept. We've heard it so many times, and even if you haven't heard it from the Bible, you may have heard people talk about it. So when you get to familiar territory, please don't gloss over it and forget everything or not pay attention to what God could be trying to teach us. So Brother Brown, good morning to the Davis family. Good morning to you. I see the A-team, Sister Shawan Abram and to Brother Tom and Kim Milam, good morning to you all, Sister Turner, Sister Brittany Davis, uh, Brother Tidwell, old uh, Jamario, he, Atlanta Hawks, he know what I'm talking about, Sister Tamia Tim, thank you for all your hard work and all my little last minute calls and texts and all that stuff, I appreciate you so much, I really do. And uh, while we're in the celebrating, uh, celebratory mode, we still want to say another God bless you and thank you, Lord. For Sister Morris and her accomplishment of being the first person in the state to do such and such, such, such uh, it's a very nerd, 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 I don't know the term, but it's significant. And now, not only is she has she gained notoriety in uh, what is it, PCSSD? Looked like Fox 16 picked up the story, and NBC picked up the story. You know. Uh, possibly CNN, Fox and Friends. And so to Sister Morris, job well done. Keep up the good work. I'm sure everyone is happy and supportive and thanking the Lord for your great accomplishment. And Romans does tell us to weep when others weep and to rejoice when they rejoice. So we are rejoicing with you and we thank the Lord for what he's done with you uh, and in your life. And I know the we were in a texting thread and somebody put in the texting thread now that she's got this achievement, she's making more money, I guess that means she's going to be giving more money to the church. Somebody put it in there. I'm not saying any names. I'm only saying that because I'm teasing and, and having fun. But somebody put that in a text and thread, and I will not tell anybody. I won't give up the name of the person as I drink my coffee. Amen. But nonetheless, we're going to get started here in, in just a moment. Um, get your Sunday school books. Uh, the current books, I believe, should be right now between 9 and 10 a.m. Uh, Brother Tim's is at the church handing those out for the ones who ordered books. Don't forget this week's lesson is the last lesson in this quarter. And it looks like we'll be going into the spring quarter. Uh, we got daylight saving time change coming up. Lord willing, we've got the Easter uh, celebration coming up uh, this evening, Lord willing, at 2 p.m. Uh, I'll be with Pastor 
Buchanan at Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church at 1200 Hanger Hill. Uh, they do have food that they will be serving for those who do plan on attending. And for those who want to attend, the time has been changed from 3 p.m. Until, uh, to 2 p.m. So just a note for that. And for those that don't feel just comfortable being out, certainly understand. Be safe. Be aware. You know your body. You know your conditions. So we certainly want you to be as wise as a serpent and, as Jesus said, as harmless as a dove. So please be careful if you do get out. Uh, I certainly will be going and can't wait to celebrate with them on their annual Black History Program. And while I'm talking, there is something, something good about studying God's Word. It just opens up so much, so much of your thought process, so much conviction to straighten up areas of your life, so much information to strengthen your faith. And so this morning, I want you to be ready this morning. Uh, 1045, we're going to continue our sermon series. And we've been looking at the dysfunctional family. And we're not just looking at what is wrong. We also look at what is right. And we contrast. And we're going to be in the book of Genesis this morning. Uh, and we're going to look at envy in the family. So I want us to look at that. It's going to be an abstract point. We're going to look at the proper interpretation. And from that biblical interpretation, we can make a proper application to our lives, our families, and hopefully make changes to give God the glory. Amen. So it is about 930. The only way to teach people to be on time is to begin on time. So we're going to start right now with prayer. And then we're going to be in John chapter 11, verses 33 to 34, a lesson entitled, A Display of Divine Glory. So if you can, take a moment, uh, pause. Uh, hopefully, if you are at home, you know, try your best to sit up and be attentive so you don't get so relaxed that you doze off and your attention fades. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to go into the study of God's word for this morning. So, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We begin by saying thank you. There's so much we can thank you for, the tangible blessings, the common grace that you give every day, the spiritual blessings, understanding your word, the answered prayer that we've received. We look around our home and our family is fine, and we thank you for those who are going through the mountaintop experience. And even if we are experiencing a valley moment, a dark experience, we're still going to thank you in the midst of it. Father, we know that if we look to the hills from whence cometh our help, all of our help comes from you, Lord. So Father, we just ask you this morning as we open your word and study this lesson from scripture, Father, we pray that you can speak to us. We pray that your word, Father, can give us not just sight, but insight we pray for direction. We pray for a right understanding. And Father, not just that we can know better, we pray that we can live better, that we can do better. We ask you, Lord, to cleanse us of our sin. And we pray, Father, even right now, in the name of Jesus, that you will help nothing, that you will help us not to be distracted by anything or anyone, that we can give you all of our attention. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. And they all said amen and amen. Good morning to you, Sister Burnett, and uh, to my Aunt Rosetta, Sister Verdi Davis, and Sister Lucretha Brown. Good morning to you as well. I'm going to continue. I'm, I'm going to give you an illustration, uh, uh, something that happened to me personally. And I'm going to use it uh, probably quite a bit today and other days because it kind of fits the importance of studying God's Word. Um, happened to me just at a car lot, randomly strolling through. And because when I was in a bad situation, needed a car, uh, I did not pay attention to the warning signs of how to buy a car the right way and credit rating and interest rates. I signed a bad deal. 2002. I bought a brand new, first time I ever in my life bought a brand new car, a 2002 Hyundai Sonata. I was just happy it had a sunroof. And it was better than the old Cadillac I was driving. And don't make your Cadillac preacher jokes. I was a preacher who had an old Cadillac. My mother gave it to me. It was hers first. I needed the car. I appreciated it. But the car, the tire tread came off. I was stranded on 630. I had went to Hyundai in North Little Rock. I said, I'm not going to spend no money on the car note. And 
I was frustrated. I called a ride back and I just signed. Well, I'm signed anywhere. I learned how when you don't know what you don't know, it can hurt you. And as I began to get more financially responsible, as I began to um, give more and be a better steward of the finances that God had given me, uh, I began to give more at church. I began to give just an, not just money. I began to give a tithe, a tenth, and an offering. Credit got a little bit better, and I was looking for another car three, four years later, and I got to examining the deal that I signed. And I said, what in the... I'm ashamed to say, it's my fault, my interest rate for my car was in the teens. Lord have mercy, they got me good. And the hardest thing was to get out of that deal, to get to a better deal. God made a way, plus the car started going down, so you're paying a car note on a car that doesn't run or doesn't run properly. Thank you, Lord. Recently, just at a car lot randomly, looking at this car, and... Yeah, long story short, the guy comes out, he give me the whole story. I know better now. Oh, 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 no, no, no. I know a whole lot better now. From 2002 to 2021, 19 years ago, thank you, Jesus. Rodney got a little bit more sense. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And as the guy's talking to me about the car, this, that, and the other, he could tell I knew a little something by the questions I was asking him. And so it, was, it wasn't even the car I wanted. I just was looking. Drove off. You know how they get your phone number. I get a block down the road. Car salesman calls me. I talked to my manager. He said, we can fix it, this, that, and the other. I said, well, what kind of interest rates do you have? Well, well, what's your credit? I said, I knew what my credit score was or is. I gave it to him. Oh, oh well, well, let me check with my boss. Let me check with him. Call me back a few seconds later. Oh, I checked with my boss, and he said interest rate don't even matter. There we go. There we go. You, we got nothing else to talk about. And just beware for those that may not know. If someone tells you when you're purchasing a vehicle, a home, anything, that the interest rate doesn't matter, when you know better, when you know that a few points up or down can greatly affect what your monthly financial obligation is, when you know that and you hear somebody, I looked at my phone, my cell phone, I'm thinking, he must be great. I didn't insult him. I didn't, I kind of laughed out loud. And he's like, what is it? I said, interest rate doesn't matter. Did I hear you? Oh yeah, my boss told me the interest rate doesn't matter, man. It don't matter what it is. You'll be, we'll just stretch out the months. I said, oh, okay. I said, thank you, but no, thank you. I got off the phone. It was, I mean, no skin off my back. You just, I just know who I'm dealing with now. Point behind that long story was to bring it to this point right here. When you know better, when you know, okay, what interest rate can be, should be, how it can affect your payments, and somebody makes a statement like that to you, and they say the interest rate doesn't matter, instantly, because of what you know, instantly you can identify this guy's a scammer or either he's a pretty bad salesman or he thinks I don't know and he's going to take advantage of me. Because I knew, because of my experience, but more importantly, because of the knowledge that I had gained over the years, you can't tell me a foolish story like that. You can't give me that line and expect me to swallow that hook, line, and sinker. I knew better. I was able to avoid Punish, well, I say punishment, avoid penalties, avoid high interest, avoid getting into a bad deal. When it comes to God's word, I'm going to say this to you very plainly. What you don't know can hurt you. This is why teaching and learning Sunday school is important. This is why studying the Bible corporately or even individually yourselves is important. This is why the responsibility from the pulpit to teach God's word, not to entertain God's people, but to teach truth. This is why these things are important. 
because it equips the people of God. It strengthens the church. It shapes the lives. It helps you, God's word, when you know what his word said. It, you, you, you know what a real servant is. You, you, you know what my responsibilities as a minister are, as a wife, as a servant, as a teacher, as a deacon. You know why? Because your information comes directly from the word of God and it shapes your life to where you don't, if I can use the car buying terms, sign a bad deal and get yourself into to some trouble. God's word is a defense in that way to where you know what his word says. And when you listen to preaching and you hear somebody say, boom, you're like, whoa, that this preacher just said from the pulpit, the equivalent of the interest rate don't matter. No, he didn't. That, what he talking about ain't in this book. You can build up a defense against heresy, bad teaching, bad doctrine, so on and so forth. So this morning, as we look into God's word, take it seriously. This is not, well, I'm going to listen to it while I wash the dishes time. Maybe you have some obligation to where you can kind of listen while you do something, depending on what it is. But if you have the chance, stop. Get, get your coffee. Get a Bible. Look, don't, don't hurt yourself. Get a pen. Get a highlighter. Look, look. every part, and I showed you all this before, I mark in my, it's not a sin to put notes in your Bible. But what if your Bible gets old and you get so many notes? Buy another one. I mean, it, it's, it's not wrong. Because you need, we need, in the times that we are living in, we need the word of God. Oh, Lord, have mercy. We need the word of God. And in this lesson, Jesus is showing a display of his divine glory. Where, where, where did we leave off? First, we had Martha. She met Jesus before he made it into the city. If you hadn't been here, my brother, the one you love, he would still be alive. Then we have her sister Mary. She goes to get her to come to the house. The last words from last week's uh, uh, lesson was Mary telling Jesus the same thing her sister just said. If you hadn't been here, my brother would not have died. And then in verse number 33, where we pick up this morning, there's a crowd of people. There's weeping going on. Two sisters are mourning the loss of a brother. The, the, the people who came to comfort them, the Jews in the community who came to comfort them, not just because they were nosy and wanted to see the fix they were in. They literally went there because they knew Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And when somebody that I love is hurt, it hurts me too. They were showing genuine concern and love. And that's where we left off. This week it picks up in verse 33. I'm going to read these verses. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Then verse 35, Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. Verse 37, and some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? He could have prevented his death, couldn't he? He's got power to open eyes. He could have stopped this. Verse 38. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, came to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, said I not to thee, remember when I said to you, said I not to thee that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, 
Lazarus come forth. And he that was dead, he was dead, came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, loose him and let him go. Beautiful story. The themes, the, 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 the application, the, the, the spiritual truth of all of this story is just bouncing all over the place. We'll try to address as many as we can in the time we have allotted. But let me tell you something. This is a powerful, powerful story. And I'm going to take just the first three verses. When Jesus saw the people weeping, verse 33 and Jesus said in verse 34, where have you laid him? And then when he gets to the place, the tomb, verse 35, it says that Jesus wept. Now, we see in verse 33, weeping. We see Mary, Martha weeping. More specifically, Mary, who was in verse 32, talking to Jesus. We see the Jews in verse 33. The Jews are weeping. And it ends in verse 35 with Jesus weeping. This little section is bracketed with tears. Mary, Martha, the Jews, a whole community of people who are crying. And it ends with Jesus crying as well. And I want to say to you people, and, and many, many need to understand this. We, we may in part get it. There's nothing wrong with tears. Don't let anyone fool you, disillusion you. Maybe they're well intentioned in trying to encourage you, but don't let anyone stop you from crying when you feel like crying, especially when you mourn the loss of someone that you love. Because I've seen many times, and I didn't quite get it as a younger preacher, a, a younger man, you just in church and you see people crying and oh, y'all stop crying. No, no, you, you don't need to cry. We serve a good God. God. No, yes, we serve a good God, but there is nothing wrong with tears. Abraham, who took care of his wife, Sarah. And when his wife, Sarah died, he got by the bedside of his wife of many years and he cried. And guess what? After he shed some tears, he got up and went and started making preparations for her burial. David, who had a child, a son. Think of it now. Although that son was conceived with adultery and then you got murder involved and you have deception involved, David still loved that child. And when that child was for the first seven days of its life, it tells us in 1 Samuel, was teetering between life and death. David laid out on the ground by the bedside of the child, wouldn't eat, wouldn't put on any clothes, and he cried. And after that child died, David got up and ate combed his hair, put some clothes on, and went to church. They said, this don't make any sense. You, you, you were crying when the child was sick. Now you seem normal after the child is alive. And David gave us some good theology. He said, listen, in essence, I know my child is in heaven because he can't come back to where I am. You die once and there's a judgment. You don't go to heaven and come back and write a book about it. You don't go to hell and come back and write a book about it. He can't come to where I am. Death is the door that you can't go in and out of. He can't come back to where I am. But one day I'll go to where he is. Peter. Remember Peter? I'll be with you to prison. I'll go with you to death. Boy, before the cock crows twice, you would have denied me three times. No, I won't. And as he's warming himself by the fire, denied him once, denied him twice. That third time, Peter used a little expletive, child, I don't even know the man. And as Jesus was being transported from judgment hall to judgment hall, for the more theological, from the civil trials to the religious trial, he locked eyes with Peter. Peter remembered, he called to mind, he remembered the promise I just made, and he ran off in the early morning and he wept bitterly. People, there's nothing wrong with tears. When you're at the funeral and you're hearing the preacher say, ashes to ashes and dust to dust, there's nothing wrong with tears. The Bible only gives one restriction that we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. In other words, 
the Bible, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13, Peter says, sorrow not as those who have no hope, meaning don't cry as if the battle is over, nothing can be done, Jesus is impotent, God has no power, I'm never going to be the same again, I'm never going to make it again, I'm never going to get through it. I'm, no, no, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you will when you hold on to God's unchanging hand. We don't shed tears as if nothing can ever be done. I'll never be fixed. I'll never be whole. Yes, you will be whole. May take some time. And I believe there are testimonies of people who are with us right now and who may see this down the road. They can say, yeah, you can make it, baby. With God, all things are possible. You can make it. But when we cry, we are not to have dead end tears, no hope tears, discouraged and never going to get right again tears. No, no, don't, don't go down that road. But there's nothing wrong with weeping. This is their brother who has just died. Now, I don't know the exact age they were, but assuming, I mean, who knows, 20s, 30s, 40s or beyond, they've had that many years of being with them. Uh, with each other and now he's gone and when Jesus got there he saw the weeping he saw the Jews weeping it says he was troubled in his spirit what that means is it saddened him listen that that is also a part of the humanity of Jesus and the love of the Savior well what do you mean that he cares so much about us that what affects us affects him he understands our pain. He doesn't just sympathize. He can empathize. Sympathy says, I'm sorry for what you're going through. I feel bad. Empathy says, I know what you're going through. I've been down that road. I'll say you can fulfill both. But more importantly, he empathizes. He knows what it's like to hurt, to feel anguish, to feel grief to feel sadness, to experience loss. He identifies with us as his creation. And Jesus asked the question, verse 34, where have you laid him? They said, come with us, Lord, come and see. And when Jesus gets to the tomb, Jesus wept. Now here's, a, now you see the sun coming in, getting me here. Now here's an important technical term to look at. The weeping in verses 33 with the Jews and Mary and Martha is different than the weeping in, verses thir in verse 35 with Jesus. The weeping in verses 33 when the people were weeping, that is the general type of weeping that you would see at any time. An audible weep. Uh, maybe there's body movement. Maybe there's tears. Maybe there's, well, of course there's tears. And, and you're catching your breath. It, it is an outward expression of crying, of tears. But when it says in verse 35, Jesus wept. The word for wept, for Jesus weeping, is a Greek word that is only used one time in the Bible. And that's right here with Jesus. Jesus did have other times to where he cried in a similar fashion to where you and I would cry, to where when we experience loss, when we experience setbacks, pain, when we go through the death of a family member, a loved one, we all are going to cry to some degree or another. We grieve differently, but most people are going to cry. That Jesus did do that. But right here, this type of weeping, the Greek word that's used is not that type. It's a Greek word that speaks to uh, silent weeping. It's, it's the type of weeping to where there was no outward expression. It was as if maybe his eyes were just wet with tears. Maybe only one tear came down of one eye. But it was as if the type of tears that the face was normal, but you could only tell he was weeping if you looked at his physical face. Somebody, when they're crying, you can tell they're crying. You can be on the back row and look at the front row and somebody got their arm around them and they got tissue and people praying with them and hugging on them and loving on them. You can tell they're crying. This would be the person sitting still and you wouldn't know they were crying unless you walked around to look at their face. That is the type of crying that Jesus had. It wasn't the humped over, slumped over. 
but it's a specific Greek word to where Jesus was saddened, but yet he didn't go to the point of uh, the outward, audible, I guess we could say childlike, <clears throat> excuse me, crying. Well, why? Look at verse number 36. Then said the Jews, they, they see his face, behold how he loved him. Verse 37 is the key. And some of them said, I'm going to paraphrase, couldn't this man who's got the power to open deaf ears, couldn't he have caused even Lazarus not to have died? See, the, 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 there's a dual thing going on right here. One is Jesus is fully aware of what he's going to do, of the miracle he's going to perform. And we'll see from the text, he's already been praying about it. And when he prays, his prayer is not a God, can you do this? It's a thank you, God, for what you're about to do. So Jesus is aware that he's about to alleviate their pain. But the tears of Jesus, because it was not the audible, humped over, I'm going to say childlike, and I only say that just to give a picture in your mind, not that people who cry this way are childish, but this childlike crying, the reason he didn't do that and the re was because he knew what he was going to do, but his sadness primarily came from the verse 37 experience, which was, they don't think I'm able to handle this. They don't think I'm able to fix this. They don't think that I'm able to change their situation. The, the lesson on page 174, I highlighted this phrase. They begin to disparage the legitimacy of his power. They think I'm impotent. They think, well, while he was alive, Jesus could have stopped it. But now that he's dead, well, what can he do now? They are looking at death as the ultimate enemy that Christ cannot conquer. So that's why the mindset of the Jews, of Mary and Martha, their mindset was, it's too late now. I mean, we kind of annoyed with you because we wouldn't have to go through this. Mary and Martha wouldn't have to experience this if you had been here. I mean, what about that Roman centurion? You didn't even go to his house. The Bible said, he just said, Jesus, I'm an unclean man. I, I don't deserve to have you in my house. But if you speak a word, guess what? You can be here. My daughter can be there and she can still be healed. He could have did it from where he was at. Why'd you have to get to Bethany? You could have just spoke a word. The fever would have cleared up. The illness would have gone away. He didn't do that. And we know you've got the power to do it. Because you open blinded eyes. John chapter 9. The child that was born blind. We thought he had committed a sin. He's not blind because of sin. But for the glory of God. You spit on the ground. Put it in his eyes with clay. He washed and now he could see. You got power to do that. But you let Lazarus die. And see this goes back to our understanding of Jesus our understanding of the, Bible, of the Bible, the character of God, the power of God. Yes, they had faith, but they still, their faith could not be increased because they didn't have a biblical understanding. Faith comes by hearing and hearing what? Hearing by the word of the Lord. Your faith is increased by what you know from scripture. And yet here we can see they are now doubting that Jesus is able to handle their situation. Pause right there. That's the interpretation. Now let's make an application to our daily living, our homes, us as God's people. It hurts God. In effect, it breaks God's heart. It makes his eyes, as it were, verse 35, well up with tears. When we doubt that he's able to fix our situation. Did not you hear the great benediction? Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think about. But we don't go to him 
if it's grief, if it's financial situations, if it's a child, if it's a job, if it's sickness, whatever. We don't go to him. No, we're going to make a Facebook post. We're going to get our phone out, take a picture of us crying. No, no, that picture ain't good. Take another picture of us crying. No, no, let me get some more tears. Come on, come on. All right, put my code back in. Take a picture of us crying and then post it on Facebook saying, y'all pray for me. Okay. We don't go to him. Guess what we'll do? Guess what we'll do? We'll be in the break room. What's wrong with you, baby? Spill our guts to everybody who want to hear. What do we do? We call the radio station. We, we, we talk to people. To, instead of going to the one who can really fix it. And guess what? When we use other means, other avenues to get rid of our grief, to handle our agony, to deal with our pain, to deal with temptation, with trials, with pressure, with problems, with all the situations of life. When we go to everything and everyone but Jesus... It's in essence with our actions saying, you don't think he can fix it. You don't think prayer is important. That's why you don't come to prayer service. That's why you don't go to the Bible. You don't think the Bible can do anything for you. That's why you don't come to church when you're hurting. You only come when you're feeling good. And when you're hurting, you stay at home. Why? Because your actions suggest, your actions scream, you don't think Jesus can do nothing about it. And those type of things. And, and listen, I've done that. I've I've done that. It hurts the heart of a holy God. Hurts him because he loves us. You think about your child who has a problem, but they feel more comfortable talking to somebody at school, some teacher, some, some counselor who may have a good relationship with the child and may be beneficial. I'm not saying that is wrong, but as a parent, what parent would be like, I would kind of prefer my child tell me because that's, my child. You can say, I held you in my womb for nine months. I, I raised you. I protected you. I provided for you. Yes, I'm here. I can promise you. Now, we are talking about dysfunctional families, but there's no reasonable, loving, godly parent that won't take care of their child, that wouldn't want their child to come to them in a time of need. Who wouldn't want that? Yeah, the counselor's okay. The teacher's okay. That's fine. But what loving parent wouldn't have their heart broken if your child talks to his quote unquote friends who, if we just use a general analogy, normally don't have more sense than they have to help them than go to the parents. So that's why, that's what fueled his weeping. Yes, he loved them because they even said that Lazarus, whom you love, is sick. Yes, he loved Mary and Martha. Of course, he loved all of them. But the real purpose behind his tears was verse 37. He knew he could perceive. He didn't have sight. He had sight, but he also had insight. Only God, Sister Collier, can fix our problems. That's right. He has insight. He could see the hearts, the thoughts, the intents of all those people at the grave. And he could say, you know what? They don't think I can handle this. They think that I should have stopped it. And because I didn't stop it, now I've let this family down and I've allowed their brother to die unnecessarily. And Jesus, it says in verse 38, groaning again within himself. It's a phrase that basically lets us know that he was still sad and he was hurt by this. He came to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And their graves, I want to make sure just to give this, it was like a, I think the lesson gave a perfect, uh, it says on page 175, under a time of action, the very bottom of that page on the left, it says Lazarus's tomb was a small cave carved out of the limestone rock of a hillside. Now, when you couple the fact that Lazarus had a place to be buried, a tomb, and you couple the fact that they even Mary had that precious ointment that she was going to use to anoint the body of Jesus and she wiped it with her hair, this kind of gives us, I guess, a background to the financial status of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were not of a poorer class because to have these things, you wouldn't be a run-of-the-mill I guess, minimum wage type of earning person. 
to have an actual place to be buried mean uh, to us it's almost common and natural and normal. In these times, that wasn't always the case. So to have these things indicates, okay, this family was, I guess, tangibly or financially well off or at least better than others in the community. So the stone that lay upon it, and the stone was upon it, upon it, excuse me, to keep animals and scavengers from getting in, also to block the smell. We can see in verse number 39, Jesus said, okay, take away the stone. Martha's like, well, she's trying to help, well-intentioned as she may be. She said, listen, Lord, by this time, his, his body is stinking and because he's been dead for, for four days. And so you, many of us may know the natural processes of what happens uh, when a body decays after death. Uh, it discolors. Um, uh, what it does is it begins to deteriorate and bacteria in the body begins to consume the body. The, the, the organs uh, begin to get consumed with bacteria and that process uh, creates a smell when gases leave the body. Uh, Sometimes the body gets bloated for a little while, you know. And so that is only this body. This body, in essence, is not who we are. We, we, we inside this body, but this body is not who we are. That, that brings credence or understanding to what Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. If this earthly tabernacle, this clay jar, is dissolved, because it will be one day, we have another building, not made with the hands of man, eternal in the heavens. This body is going to suffer from the curse of the garden that came from disobedience. From the dust you came, to the dust you're going to return. But when we die, the body goes back to the ground. There's a natural chemical process of discoloration, decomposition, this earthly tabernacle goes back to the dust. It decomposes. The body goes to the ground, but the soul goes to the Lord. Now, let me pause. For the Christian, the soul instantly goes back to God. Goodbye world. Hello, Jesus. You might touch that body. It might be warm. But guess what? If that person is technically dead, guess what? That body is going to go through the processes that God put it through. But for the Christian, goodbye world, hello Jesus. There's another body getting created for them, not made with the hands of man. So here we can see that Martha trying to help Jesus. Jesus, this is going to be a gruesome sight. There's going to be a smell. This is not tactful we, we don't this is going to be difficult jesus maybe in trying to alleviate our fears and calm our tears and clear our tears rather maybe in trying to do that you're forgetting just this little practical point that he's been dead for four days and the body's decomposing look at the response of jesus verse 40 remember when i said to you i believe that's in verse 23 with the verse 23 that your brother shall rise again and you'll see the glory of God. Remember when we had that conversation? Remember when I said that to you? That if you believe that you will see the glory of God. Now, he said, he calls her mind back. Oh, please stay with me right here. Thank you, Lord. He calls her mind back to something that he said in the past, recent past, that can help her in the present. He asked her when they had their conversation. I, I wanna, I'm gonna make sure I pull this up. He said, do you believe this? And she said, yes, yes, I, I do believe. He calls her mind back to what he said in the past to help her where she is right now. That goes back to my whole analogy an illustration about the car. 
about knowing interest rate. And because of what you don't know, it can hurt you, hurt you. But because of what I do know, when the car salesman said to me, the interest rate doesn't matter. I'm like, man, you must be out of your mind because I know better now. And I know what I learned from the past can help me right here in my present. And what we learned from the word of God, though it was last week, last night, yesterday, last year, these things that we learn, they can help you when you get to your current situation. Jesus said, remember the conversation that we had. Remember I said, if only if you believe you could see the glory of God. What you know can't help you. Most importantly, what we know from the word of God can help us. Various subjects, just to prove out this point, to, to make it more clear for those it may not be clear to. I don't care what the current state of society is, of the culture is. I don't care what politicians say or even just Judy. When they all come together in a chorus and say, you're not supposed to spank a child. Just love on them and they'll be okay. The Bible says you're not supposed to abuse a child. Of course not. No scripture condones that. But it does say if you spank him, that you can save his soul from hell. So I have now a choice to make. I'm either going to do what you all say, Judge, Judy, and whoever else, or I'm going to do what the word says. Now that I know what the word says, and I come across folk that's telling me something, mm -mm, I know what the Bible says that can help me in my current situation. This pandemic and many people's hours have been cut. Many people's jobs have been dissolved. Some people were living off of the, I guess, the employment or unemployment check, and they were giving you more and more. And, and now that that's cut off, well, what am I going to do? Well, thank you for the $600, but if you're behind three months on rent and you got to buy groceries and car note insurance, I mean, I'm thankful for the $600. It's better than zero, but $600 ain't going to get me caught up depending on what your overhead is. So how do I do? How do I... How do I handle it? What do I do in my current situation? Well, go back to the past. Remember what the Bible says? To trust in the Lord with all thine heart. and Lean not into your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all of your ways and he will direct your path. Remember that my God shall supply all of your need according to to his riches and glory, you go back to what the Bible says, to what God has said. In this case, Jesus is saying, go back just a few moments. We just had this discussion. I asked you, did you believe? And you said, yes. Well, now it's time for the rubber to meet the road. Now it's time. Remember that I told you, verse 40, that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So Jesus now, he answers her objection. There's no response. The people kick, pick up doing what they were doing. Verse 41, they took the stone from the place where the dead was laid, where Lazarus' body lay. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and he prays. I promise you I can stay here for a whole lot long. A whole lot longer than I'm going to spend. Jesus prays. The first Thing out of his mouth in his prayer, Father, I thank you. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I, I'm, I'm trying my best not to prolong the time. The first words out of his mouth is, Lord, thank you. His prayer was not a petition. Father, I'm asking you right now if you would do this. Remember Solomon, not Solomon. I was going to mix up. Samson, hair was cut, eyes gouged out. That second time in the scripture he prayed, if he prayed more, he wouldn't have been caught by the Philistine. Lord, please, if you can avenge me for my two eyes, for what they have done to me, just give me my strength. Just one last time. He wasn't, Jesus was not asking God to do something. He was thanking him for what he already was going to do. He, <laughs> he was saying, thank you for what I know you're going to do. How do we do that? When you look into the word and you lost your job 
and the bills are piling up. But you see in his word where he says, my God shall supply all of your needs. Yes, the bills are piling up. Yes, you're filling out resumes online and going to interviews via Zoom or maybe in person. Yes, you're looking for a job. But in the midst of that, with tears running down your face, you can still say, Lord, I thank you. Thank you for what? I don't know what job. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how you're going to supply my needs, but I believe that you're going to do it. Why? Because you told me that you would. You said that you would supply my needs. You told me. Th th this goes back to something Deacon Gardner will always say. We were going from one location, another location, interest rates, building, contractors, banks, saving, giving. And he would say, wait, 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 y'all. Yes, there's a current situation that we need to address. But if God says, don't forsake to assemble yourself together, don't you think he's going to provide a place for us to assemble together? So even though you don't know how he's going to work it out, you can thank him and trust and believe that he's going to work it out. So I don't know how God's going to supply my need. We ain't talking about getting money to support a mistress. We ain't talking about getting money to support a drug habit. We ain't talking about getting money to support you in Oakland at the dog tracks, the, the, the racing truck. No, no, no. Your needs. I know he'll supply it. If that's a job, he supplied my needs. If it's a friend bringing me food in the morning, lunch at noon, and a dinner at night, he supplied my needs. If it's some random act of providence, the same way God did Elijah. Remember Elijah, when he ran from King Ahaz, it's not going to rain, and he ran down by the brook, and God sent a raven to feed him from his mouth, bringing meat and food and bread to the running, escaped prophet Elijah. And then God told him to go to the brook. I wish I had some people that knew First Kings. And the Bible says that the brook dried up. Well, wait a minute, God, you, you told me to come to the brook. And there's no water in the land. I got a little bit of water. And now the water has dried up. What are you teaching me? That I want you to trust me more than the stuff I give you. Even if I send a raven, if I send you to the brook, you better know that raven and that brook, that's not your provision. That person that gives you the money, that's not your provision. The job that pays you the check, that's not your provision. That friend that comes by and brings you food, thank you for it, but they're not your real provider. I am. So when things go down in society and gas goes to $4 again and a pandemic hits and jobs are being cut and dissolved, that job wasn't your real provider? That money in your bank? Money talks, and it says two words, bye-bye. <laughs> it takes years to save it, and it could be gone like that. Live off your savings for a little while. You'll see how fast it can go. I've been there. So God is your ultimate provider. So in this situation, he says, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. My car about to be repossessed. Lost half of the income in this household when Danielle stopped working. Two car payments. Mortgage. Integer didn't care. Let me tell you that. And then, and, and just to testify, I saw how things were going in the church. And I prayed because I felt the Lord doing something. I said, Lord, I, I, listen, I ain't trying to win no points with nobody. But, Lord, you got to help me because <laughs> I feel like you're telling me to take a pay cut at church, Lord. So you, I, I need your help, Jesus, because... <laughs> Now, I just want to make sure there ain't no signals getting crossed here. Prayed and prayed and prayed. Prayed and prayed and prayed. Waking up out of my sleep, praying and praying and praying. Praying and praying. Lord, are you sure? Are you sure? How can, if it's hard on this amount and the amount goes down and I've already got bills everywhere, how can I? He said, that's the whole point. You can't. And as soon as I sat down with Deacon Marcus Davis, as soon as I sat down with Sister Cheryl Brown and said, here's what God telling me. Listen. Shave a little bit off the top. Uh, we need the money. The church needed this, that, and the other. As soon as I did what God said do, he showed me something. God is better than business world. 
He's better, listen to me, than a check from New Hebron. He's better than money in your savings. He's better than a credit card. He's better than U.S. Bank. He's better than Discover, American Express, Visa, and MasterCard. He's better than our vets. God supplied my needs. I was doing better with less. Let me stop right here. That's why you just say, Lord, I thank you. Because when you trust him and lean not to your own understanding and acknowledge him in all of your ways, he will direct your path. So guess what now? How'd you make it? Thank you, Lord. I ain't got no car no, no more. They took the car. Now it's paid for. How'd you make it? Thank you, Lord. You opened the door. <laughs> Was able to get a lump sum of money just a year and a half ago. Lord, thank you. Got caught up on mortgage. <laughs> thank you, Lord. All them little credit cards, little bitty credit card. Got them paid down to zero. How'd you do it? I ain't got 20 more minutes to tell you, but I can tell you this. It only happened as a result of obedience. Trusting God. So here Jesus is at the tomb and he's trusting God. He prays. And in verse 43, when he spoke with a loud voice, he cried out, Lazarus. Come out here, doc. I need to holler at you for a minute. Lazarus, what you doing? You ain't doing nothing. Come on. Now, I'm not going to go into what we would traditionally say in our tradition. How he had to call Lazarus. Because <laughs> if he just would have said, come forth, everybody would have came out the grave. No, no, it ain't y'all time yet. Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead for four days, verse 44, he came forth. I don't know how he got to the door because his body was wrapped in, they, they would wrap him almost like a mummy. But if Jesus, I read this in the commentary, it said, if Jesus can bring him back to life, he can certainly make a way for him to get a few steps to the edge of the grave to come forth. And Jesus said, well, here's what we need to do. Take those grave clothes off of him. Loose him and let him go. Lazarus, who was dead, came back to life. If Lazarus didn't have a testimony before this time, <laughs> he definitely has a testimony right now. Imagine Lazarus listening to the Jewish leaders say he's an imposter. He's a blasphemer. He should be killed. He should be stoned. He's not God's son. He just Mary's son. He ain't the really anointed one. He's not the Christ. Guess what? All that talk wouldn't mean nothing to Lazarus. Why? Because Lazarus would say, I know what he did for me. So when you're walking in this world and they laugh at Jesus, they make fun of prayer, they talk down about Christians, they say, y'all crazy going to church, putting that preacher in a Cadillac and giving money where folk ain't doing this and doing that. They can talk all they want to talk because you know what he did for you. You know how he brought your situation back to life. You know how he saved you, how he changed you. How he made a way for you. How he opened doors for you. You can hear all the talk in the world. Sounds good from very intelligent sounding people. From the media to some of these crazy churches out here on the corner talking this nonsense. Y'all can talk all you want to. But when I obeyed the Lord. When I was sinking deep in sin. Far from a peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. It was nobody but the master of the sea that heard my despairing cry. And from the waters of death, he lifted me and now safe am I. Talk all you want to talk, but I know what he did to me. 
I know what he's done for me, my family. And guess what? I know you can say the same thing. I know that God dried my tears. You can say, I know God kept me from losing my mind. I know it wasn't nobody, God, that put me to bed that night. It wasn't nobody. But talk all you want on the outside. Have all your funds. Make fun of Christians. I know you're in college now. And some professor telling you all kind of fancy stuff. And you look at Christians like they crazy. They still, you know, okay, have your fun. But I know what he did for me. I'll, I'll sum it up this way. Let me give you Lazarus' testimony. You can't make me doubt him. Because <laughs> I know too much about him. I know what he done for me. And Jesus showed a display of his divine glory. They positioned themselves to be blessed, all of them collectively, to one degree at one time or another based on their obedience to him. And it's our obedience that opens the doors for us to see the divine glory of God. And so we'll end right there. It's 24 after. No, don't worry. I still got my little notes right here for me. Got my sermon notes right here. Listen, I'm, I'm going to stop right there. If there's somebody that, that has not given their life to Christ, nobody but Jesus is to turn to dry your tears. I see it. If you have not given your life to Christ, you may not be as bad as you can be. You may be a morally good person, but you are as bad off as you can be. Because without Christ, you will stand before him and hear him say, part from me, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. That can change based on what you believe from scripture. Not believe as a head knowledge, but you put your faith in Christ. Believe in this sense. You believe the biblical account that Jesus lived and how the Bible says Jesus died. In early Sunday morning, the record is from the Bible. He rose from the grave with all power in his hand. He atoned for our sins. He paid for our sins with his precious blood. Without that payment, somebody would have to foot the bill and that would be us. And we're not good enough. Jesus died for our sins, all of them, past, present, and future. And when you realize that, when that seeps down into your heart, it humbles you. It makes you repent. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. Father, forgive me. This is not the life for me. I want to change. And guess what happens? Something happens on the inside of you. You may not get, get goosebumps. It may not be a wind blowing. But upon the profession of your own faith, you are saved. And you should express that in obedience by observing one of the ordinances of the church, which is baptism. And so if you're out there, if you have not accepted Christ, we invite you to do so. You can please reach out to us via our church website, newhebronlr.org. Go to the quick links reference and you'll find where you can drop down through the menu. And if, you, if you've accepted Christ, we'd love to hear from you. And we can make a way to get you to the water. Whatever we need to do, I promise you, we can and we will get it done. So I appreciate all of your time. We still have just a few minutes, just under 20 minutes to 1045. And we'll come back yet again with our morning message entitled The Dysfunctional Family. And this morning we'll be in Genesis chapter 14 and we're going to be looking at envy in the family. We're going to use an abstract illustration, uh, a, a direct interpretation to make an application to our lives rather. So I appreciate your time and it's my prayer that God will bless you and keep you until we see you again. Hopefully we'll see you all back at around 1045 as we worship even more. So God bless you and I pray that God keeps you safe.